So what I'm going to talk to you today about, so I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about Rust. So Rust is my favorite programming language. Um, I think anybody who spent any time using Rust, it is also their favorite programming language. Um, and so this is going to be uh, my love letter to Rust that you guys are all going to be forced to listen to. Um, and because uh, you guys work with data, you're data scientists, I'm going to tell you a little bit about where I think Rust fits in into the data sciences uh, toolbox, because I certainly think it does have a place. So if we think, uh, well, actually, before we start, I'm going to tell you what this talk is not. So it's not going to be a real deep dive into Rust. I'm going to tell you some of the things that I think are cool about Rust, but there is so much more I could tell you. I could get up here and talk for hours about how great Rust is. Um, it's not going to be an in-depth comparison between Rust and other languages. I will talk a little bit about other languages, but it's not going to be an in-depth comparison about it. Um, but what I am going to do is I'm going to give you a taste of what makes Rust great why I think Rust is cool and why you should use Rust, um, some reasons why you might want to include it in your toolbox, uh, and um, I'm also going to give uh, a little bit of uh, a showcase of where you might already be using Rust in your tech stack without even realizing it, um, because Rust is, is really getting in everywhere. So if we think about like the typical data science uh, stack, uh, the languages that are common, the tools that are common, Python is probably number one uh, in terms of the most commonly used languages in data science. Um, R is also pretty popular. SQL, again, super popular. Those are the, probably the top three. Depending on like the context, you're going to find some other things as well. Some JVM languages like Scala and Java, um, some array languages like K and Q, particularly uh, KDB Plus for like high performance um, uh, databases, particularly in kind of like finance. Um, and then you will also find like other languages, compiled languages for writing high performance code. And those are going to be your C, your C++ and Fortran. Fortran is still used. NVIDIA is still coming out with new compilers. So don't uh, forget about Fortran. Um, so if we think about languages like R and Python, uh, why are they popular? Well, the reason why they're popular is they're easy to use. You don't really have to think about memory, right? These languages have garbage collectors. The runtime is going to manage the memory for you. You don't have to explicitly define types. That's apparently a good thing. Uh, it makes it easier to use the language. Um, and you also have access to a great range of libraries. So the ecosystem around languages, particularly Python, uh, it's great for if you want to do data science. Um, Python is a great language for the ecosystem. But uh, these languages like Python and R, they also have downsides. So they tend to be slow. That's the big thing, right? Um, they also, they're not great for writing like lightweight parallel code. Python is particularly bad. R is a little bit better. But if you're writing parallel code, you're spinning up like new processes with a whole uh, like runtime and interpreter running in that. Uh, that's not lightweight. It's kind of, it's heavy. Um, and then also the downside is that you don't have to define types <laughs> because writing code without types is actually a nightmare. You um, uh, you like you know, when you're doing code reviews on somebody's code and you get a function that you have to do a code review on and there's no type hints and you don't know what the function is going to take, you don't know how it's going to behave, uh, that, is, that is difficult. So at least Python nowadays, you know, you can put type hints in your Python, so that makes it a little bit better. It's becoming more popular. Uh, people are realizing the value of actually defining types, but you, you're not getting any, uh, you know, you're not getting any guarantees there because even if your your uh, uh, your types are defined incorrectly, it's still going to run. You're just going to get runtime errors. So you're not the compiler is not going to catch you, right? Um, it uh, relies on you obeying your linter warnings, which uh, some people like to ignore. Um, so how do you get around the slowness of Python and R? Well, the easy way to do it, well. The hard way to do it uh, is to rewrite performance critical code in uh, C, C++, or Fortran, right? Um, 
There are some alternatives if you're working in Python. So uh, there's Cython, uh, there's PyPy, there's Number, right, which allows you to write more Python-like code, but with higher performance. Um, there's downsides to that. It is high performance, but it's still not as performant as it could be. Um, and lots of popular libraries take this approach where they actually write you know, the code in C or C++. Those are called under the hood. Uh, so you see this approach in like popular uh, Python packages like NumPy and stuff like that. So NumPy includes a lot of C. SciPy includes uh, some C uh, and some Fortran. Uh, you have lang uh, you have Packages like pandas include some C, include some Cython as well. Um, uh, and in R, uh, you have uh, packages like dplyr, uh, and that includes a lot of C++ code, right? But writing C and C++ comes with a big cost. Uh, and the cost is that they're terrible languages and they're hard to use. Um, you can spend hours debugging memory faults, so seg faults, um, because you have to like manually manage the memory that's a pain. Uh, the tooling around C and C++ is also pretty poor. The linters aren't that great. Um, LSPs that give you kind of autocomplete uh, is kind of sucks in C++. Uh, build systems also suck. If you've ever tried to like diagnose problems with like CMake, it's a nightmare. Um, it doesn't have like easy to use tools for package management or uh, like repositories that you can just like, you know, how you can just pip install stuff in Python. Can't do that in C and C++. Uh, and they're not r well designed for writing like high level functional style code, which is like the way that I like to program. So I like to, you know, I don't, I'm not really a Haskell programmer, but I like to write my code kind of Haskell-like, right? Uh, and C and C++ are not really designed to do that. Um, so, if we're thinking about like writing high performance code as data scientists, most data scientists aren't professional programmers. And just the idea of trying to like deal with that nightmare that C and C++ brings is just not worth it. Just put up with the slowness is, uh, is how most people kind of deal with it, right? Um, it's better to, to do that than to try and deal with C and C++. But there is an alternative to writing C and C++ uh, and that is Rust. Uh, and so that's what I want to talk to you about, about how amazing Rust is. So a little bit of history about the Rust programming language. It came out of Mozilla around about uh, 2006, started as a private project uh, from a Mozilla engineer, uh, but then Mozilla kind of took over uh, the stewardship of it and it was used in their server browser the, uh, engine. Then, uh, I don't know if you remember all the uh, the problems that Mozilla had, a lot of people were laid off, uh, restructuring and stuff like that. Uh, and so uh, the Rust Foundation was then set up to take uh, control of, um, of Rust. So uh, because I think that the team that was working on it with, in Mozilla kind of got disbanded. Um, it has an emphasis on security, uh, on performance and on usability. So security is just the way that it handles memory. So C and C++, because you're manually managing memory, you can, um, you can have all these kind of memory faults that are exploitable and it's a security problem. Uh, you'd get none of that with Rust. Um, you get high performance, so you get C-like performance. In fact, in some cases, faster than C performance. Um, and then the usability of it is just second to none. It is, uh, it is an incredibly usable language that is just designed to make it easy to use. Uh, it's sometimes pigeonholed as a systems programming language, right? So people go, oh, well, it's just for writing like low level code. I think that's a mistake. Um, it has a bunch of features that allow you to write high level style code, like functional style code that you might write in something. In fact, there's, there's uh, Ruby was mentioned earlier. There's some bits of Rust that look really like Ruby, right? Which is a really high level uh, interpreted dynamic language. Um, so you can write code like that, but uh, it's a low level language. Uh, it's incredibly flexible. It has a macro system, not too unlike uh, Julia's that allow you to just like, you know, mock up simple like DSLs or add new language features, uh, which you can do through the macro system. And the macro system um, 
there's no runtime cost at doing the macro, at writing macros, because it all compiles down, expands to like standard Rust code. Um, and it has an emphasis on what, on what they call zero cost abstractions. So you can write high level style code, you can use like uh, generic functions, so functions that will take any type um, that matches like kind of certain constraints. Um, you can use collections and like iterators and stuff like that. Um, you can use macros, and all of that is going to compile down to uh, the same assembly that you would get if you wrote your code in like more low level C style code. Um, so it allows you to kind of do things in a high level way uh, and get the performance of a low level. Um, a low level language, because it is a low level language. Um, so what makes Rust great? So the first thing is uh, memory safety. So you're not manually managing memory in the same way that you're doing in C and C++. You're not having to write malloc and free everywhere, because um, that stuff is really difficult to get right. It's really difficult to manage memory properly, which is why you get these memory bugs. Um, so anybody who's spent any time writing C will have come across this. It's a nightmare. Uh, so, you know, um, you want to avoid doing that. The alternative that is usually contrasted with this is to use a language like Python or R. It's got a garbage collector. The runtime manages the memory for you. You, the programmer, doesn't. The language does it for you. Um, so garbage collection makes life easier, but you get a runtime cost because the garbage collector has to, every now and again, check whether you're using a bit of memory and free it if you're not. Um, and that's... that. Uh, you're spending CPU cycles on running something that isn't your code, right? It's something else. Um, so Rust gets around this by having a different memory model. This is the thing that makes Rust most different to other languages. And it has this idea of like ownership. So any value that you have will have an owner, right? Um, and any value can only have one owner. And when the owner goes out of scope, the memory is freed. So here's a little bit of Rust code. Here I'm just creating a vector. Uh, and then um, I'm calling that vector v1, and then I'm assigning v1 to v2. So now v2 owns that value that was previously in v1, and so now if I try to do something with v1, I'm going to get an error. The compiler is, this won't compile um, because uh, that v1 is no, longer, uh, is no longer valid, right? So this is like this ownership idea. But with ownership, uh, you also get the concept of borrowing, right? So each value can only have one owner, but Lots of things can borrow those values uh, with a reference. And so the borrow checker, which checks your borrows, checks that you're doing the right, uh, obeying the rules of borrowing, uh, will, uh, uh, will check your code to make sure that the memory is being, uh, and to ensure memory safety. So here's an example where I'm borrowing something. So here I'm just making a string, uh, sending it to S1. Um, then I have a function here called calc length, and I, you can see the little ampersand uh, before uh, the, the variable name. So that means that I'm just passing the reference. So that calc length is going to borrow that value. It's not going to own that value. Uh, so then I can use that value again after the function call. If I passed it as uh, a, not a reference, as a value, then that function would then own uh, that value. And when the function ends, so the value would go out of scope, and so it would be dropped, right? Um, so this is how the, this, uh, this borrowing uh, works. Uh, now, the other thing that makes Rust great, or the next thing that makes Rust great is, uh, is performance. So Rust, when you assign v uh, values to variables, um, everything is immutable by default, right? So you can't change values after you've assigned them unless you explicitly say that you want it to be mutable. So immutability is by default. I think this is a better system uh, than, than other languages. It's kind of like a functional thing. So if you've used Haskell or something like that, this will be familiar to you where data is immutable. Um, and because it's immutable, you can pass data between threads. It can be accessed from different threads. And you're not going to get race conditions or memory bugs or things like that. So it allows you to write parallel code really easily. Um, so these memory safety guarantees means you just don't have to worry about a whole class of memory bugs that can occur when you're writing parallel code. Um, because it has these high level features like iterators, um, you can just, if you want to write like parallel code where you're applying a function to say a vector, uh, like you might do with like a list comprehension in, in Python, you can just swap out iter for par iter and it'll run it in parallel. Super easy, right? Uh, 
nothing to even think about there. Uh, and then it also ships with like, uh, with in the standard library, um, functions for spinning up lightweight threads, similar to like Go routines if you're a Go programmer. Uh, it has JavaScript style async await for doing async things. So writing parallel code, async code, high performance code, super easy uh, in, in Rust. Um, again, the zero cost abstraction is going to help you as well. So you can write like this high level code like iterators uh, and using iterators and you don't have to worry uh, about taking a performance hit. If you want to write low level code, you can too. So if you want to do vectorized stuff with like SIMD, so that's when you have like uh, a single instruction that is processed in, in parallel on, on a processor um, across multiple data. Uh, you can do that, it's built into the standard library, right? And it's super easy, it's portable, you don't have to worry about what processor it's running on, uh, it's just amazing and fantastic. Um, you can use generic functions, again, super easy without a performance hit. Its type system is, I don't know, I would describe it as magical. So it doesn't have a null type, right? So in Python or R, you have nuns, or you have nulls, or you have NAs, or NANs, and these can cause uh, runtime bugs. Uh, so you constantly have to like check for them to make sure that they're not there so that your code doesn't crash. Um, with Rust, it has uh, what's known as an option type, uh, which is similar to a maybe in Haskell, if you've used Haskell, that has a sum and a none variant. And so if you have a function that might return an invalid uh, or a non value, you can just make it return an option and then you're forced to actually deal with like the possibility that there might be nothing there because you can't you can't process an option so you have to you have to explicitly check okay is it the non variant is it the sum variant if it's a sum variant give me the value that is inside it um, error handling instead of using uh, what I think is an awful system of of like uh, catching exceptions with try and accept or try catch in R. Um, it has a result type, which has an okay and an error variant, uh, which is similar to uh, an either in, uh, in Haskell, or similar if you, if you use uh, R and you've used uh, safely from the per library, it's similar to how that works as well. Um, so these types uh, are, they're examples of enums. Um, so enums allow you to do pattern matching and the compiler is gonna make sure that you've come. So if you think about, so Python now has pattern matching uh, with its like, I think it's called the match case syntax. Um, and R has it with like switch in case. Um, with pattern matching in, uh, in Rust, if you're matching on enums, the compiler is gonna force you to match every possible variant that could occur. So that so you have to do exhaustive matching. The compiler will tell you if you're not doing exhaustive matching. So you won't get runtime errors because the compiler, the, your, compi your code won't compile, right? Um, so this that whole class of bugs just disappears. Um, enums are also great for doing uh, like object-oriented style inheritance. So I think object-oriented style programming was a mistake, and I think inheritance is one of like the big things of why it was a mistake. How do you work out inheritance between your classes? Who knows? Um, no one's got time to think about that. Uh, but um, enums allow you to do object-oriented inheritance right, how it should have been done in the first place. Um, it has a trait system, which is similar to like interfaces in other languages, uh, which allow you to, um, to uh, define shared behavior between different types um, uh, and where you can just, uh, where you don't have to write a lot of boilerplate code because you can rely on like common features between the types. Um, and so here's just an example of some pattern matching done. So here I'm, I'm creating a vector uh, and then I'm trying to get the third value from that. Uh, and this will automatically return an option. Uh, and then I can say, okay, well, is this gonna be a sum? And if it is, give me the value in it. And if it's a none, do something else. So in this case, I'm saying, give me a zero, right? Um, so, so pattern matching with enums is fantastic. The macro system is amazing as well. Um, you can just uh, make the language have features that it doesn't have, right? So Rust, one of the things that Rust doesn't have, which languages like Python and R do have, is Python and R have default parameters for functions. So if you have an argument uh, and you don't pass a value to it, it will take a default. Um, 
both Python and R have like named function parameters, so you can so you can specify uh, a particular uh, a keyword for for its arguments. Rust doesn't have this. Rust it doesn't have keyword arguments, and you have to define it everything. But you can just write a macro that gives you that feature. So I have a, a, a Rust uh, crate, which is what they call packages, which gives you access to um, a lot of like the uh, the base um, R kind of stats functionality from from the um, some from the stats package and some from the from the from the R base package. Uh, and so this is like, let's say I want to use the, the PT. So this is for non-central T distribution. This is how I would write the Rust, uh, sorry, how I would write the R code. I'd use these named arguments. And there's a bunch more, but I'm not going to put them in there because R is just going to give me the de default. This is Rust code. The only difference here is there's that exclamation mark there because this is a macro. And so now I can write a Rust code that looks identical to the R code. I can even swap it around. I can get it to behave exactly like R would behave. But this is Rust. It's going to compile down. To, it's going to expand to Rust uh, and compile down to the same, um, same assembly as if I was writing just regular Rust. So the macro is amazing. Uh, you can do so much more with the macro system. So this isn't uh, HTML. This is Rust, right? It's a Rust macro that makes it look looks like HTML, right? And so this is going to compile to Rust. Um, Rust doesn't have a pipe operator. doesn't matter. You can just make one. So there's a macro uh, that allows you, so if you, if you use Julia, this kind of looks like how, how I, the, I think it's chain in Julia or something like that. But yeah, Rust doesn't have a pipe operator like languages like R does. You can just make one. It's fine. If you want a pipe operator, you can do it. It doesn't have infix notation either for functions. You can just make that as well, right? Uh, so you can just do anything, and uh, you can just you can shape the language to how you want it. In terms of usability, if you've ever written C or C++ and you've tried to de decode compiler errors, it's a nightmare. This is the Rust compiler, the friendliest compiler ever. So. Uh, this is the code earlier that I said you would get an error because you're using a value after it's been moved. Rust tells you that. It tells you exactly where your error is. It explains your error. Uh, not only that, it suggests how you might fix the error. The compiler is going to tell you what you did wrong and how you could do it better. And then if I need more help, I can just ask the compiler to explain the error in more detail, and it'll take me to the documentation, and it'll explain everything for you. Right? No more Googling around, what does this error mean? The compiler will just tell you. Um, the tooling around Rust is amazing. Uh, Rust ships with uh, a package manager um, and a build system. So no more worrying about CMake, no more worrying about like the nightmare that is Python packaging systems, right? Rust ships with one. Rust also ships with a linter. So you don't have to like think about like Pyrite or Rough or whatever built in. Built-in LSP, so autocomplete and all of that built-in. Uh, formatting built-in, so you don't have to think about like, oh, am I going to use black or am I going to use some other Python formatter? Built into Rust, if you use the one that comes with the language. It's got a centralized package uh, repository uh, like MPN or CRAN or PyPy, so you can just install stuff super easy, all just built-in. But Rust for data science. Uh, so that's why I love Rust. But why might we use it in, uh, in data science? So you might already be using it. Um, if, you, like me, you are incredibly frustrated with pandas and you've sought an alternative. So pandas is just this kind of standard data frame library in Python. Um, it sucks because it's slow. It sucks for other reasons. But one of the reasons why it sucks is because it's slow. Um, it's written in C and Cython, but it's still slow. Uh, but there's an alternative, uh, Polars. And so Polars is written in Rust, um, but you can install it and use it just like you do uh, Pandas in Python. Um, and it's fast. It is very fast. Uh, it's faster than Pandas. Uh, it's faster than dplyr. It's faster than data table. Uh, it's faster than uh, dataframes.jl, the Julia data frames library. Um, 
So you can start using it today without writing any Rust. You can include Rust in your toolbox. Uh, so if you check out the DuckDB benchmarks, uh, Polis comes out top the, uh, except for DuckDB, but it is their benchmarks. Uh, so you can use, uh, you can use that today. Um, but Polis, it's a Rust library, uh, so you can use it with Python, right? Uh, you can use it with R if you want as well. Uh, you can use it with Node.js. Um, but if you want to write some Rust, you can do kind of weird things like this. So I've taken Polars and I've compiled this to WebAssembly. Um, so this is not, uh, there's no SQL server running here. I have a static, um, a static server with a CSV file on it and uh, compiled to WebAssembly running in this browser, right? Not on a server somewhere, actually in, in the slides. Um, I have a SQL query engine, so I can write SQL queries, and it's going to query that static uh, CSV file, so I can just actually run this query. Um, whoop. And it will just run that query, so I can write SQL. There's no SQL server, so usually you wouldn't expose this to the internet, allow people to like write raw SQL queries to your server. But there's no SQL server. This is just running in the browser. Um, there's also great, uh, an increasing ecosystem for uh, packages that are relevant for data scientists. So there's a crate called ND array, which is kind of like a NumPy alternative. It's designed to be very similar to NumPy. It includes all the basic functionality that you'd expect, including powerful tools for um, linear algebra. Um, using that, you can build machine learning and statistics frameworks in Rust. Uh, there's already some of this being built. So there's a crate called Linfer, which um, makes use of ND array that provides a lot of the functionality that you get in SK Learn, including things like PCA and ICA and SVM and Lasso and Ridge and all of those things that you might want to do. Uh, decision trees, logistic regression, uh, all in Rust. Um, and there's bindings for things like the GSL, um, the GNU Scientific Library for LibTorch, which runs PyTorch. Um, there's crates for doing like automatic differentiation, Gaussian process regression, all of that, that kind of ecosystem is growing all the time. Um, there's other cool things like Surreal DB, which is like kind of a next gen, um, like SQL like database. There's um, a language written in Rust called Prequel, which compiles down to SQL, but includes far more power. Um, to do other kinds of cool things uh, as well. Um, other uh, like Rust tools that you can use now, um, so include things like Pydantic. So if you use Pydantic for doing data validation, it's kind of slow. The current version, version two, is going to be uh, maybe 50 times faster because they've rewritten the core in Rust. Um, if you use hugging face models for uh, for doing you, you know kind of language model stuff, hugging faces tokenizer is written in Rust. Um, if you're trying to lint large code bases and you're struggling with like the current Python linting tools, um, there's a Python linter called Rough, which is now being picked up by a lot of large Python projects, written in Rust, so it's super fast. Um, if you like Julia, installing Julia and managing Julia. Um, uh, installations is kind of a nightmare. Uh, there's Julia up, which allows you to manage your Julia installation with Rust. Uh, there's Rye, which is a package manager for Python uh, written in Rust. There's other tools like DataBend, which is a open source Snowflake alternative. So if you use Snowflake, if you're data engineers and use Snowflake, there's an open source alternative for that. Another thing that might be interesting for data engineers is Cube. It's kind of semantic layer for building data applications, also written in Rust. Um, there's uh, Rust crates for taking models, that are, so trained models from, say, uh, SKLearn or XGBoost. So you can train those models, compile them to Rust, and so you can run your inference in, uh, in Rust, so you can in, so you can compile it. You can do things like compile it to WebAssembly and put it in the browser, right? You don't have to have a server that's running your inference. You can run it in the browser, um, or you can run it in you know run it far more efficiently. Um, 
So there's lots of cool things for data scientists that is happening in Rust, and more and more of it is happening um, all the time. Um, but, you know, Rust is great, but one thing that Rust isn't great for is interactive programming, which you might do a lot of as a data scientist, where you're kind of exploring stuff. There is actually a Rust Jupyter kernel, so you can run Rust in a Jupyter notebook, but it's not great because as a compiled language, it's, it, it's a little bit slow because it has to do that compilation step. Um, so what you might want to do instead is, you know, include Rust within your current uh, kind of Python or R workflow. But it's super easy to do that. It's super easy to call Rust uh, from these languages. You can call Rust from any language that speaks C, which is most of them. Um, so that includes things like Python, R, MATLAB, and, and Julia. For some of these languages, you have to write the C code yourself. So if you want to know what that looks like, I've got a, a couple of links down there. I have a blog post for how to do that for, uh, for R. Um, and if you are unfortunate enough to use MATLAB, um, I, have a, I have a MATLAB package as well, which is written in Rust that shows you how to write that C glue code so that you can call Rust from, uh, from, from MATLAB. But you don't have to, if you're using R and you're using Python, you don't have to write the C yourself. Uh, there's a, uh, a package called PyO3, which allows you to write uh, uh, Python packages in Rust. Um, it does, it's, uh, it builds um, the wheels for you, it even includes the CI code to do, to build the wheels on CI. Um, the tooling around it is amazing. Uh, it's super easy to use. Uh, so if you want to write Rust code to use in your Python packages, PyO3 is the definite thing to check out. Um, in the R space, there's Extender um, that allows you to write R packages in Rust. You can pass R types back and forth between, uh, between Rust and R. Um, you can even call all like the C code that uh, runs under the hood when you run R. Um, with a crate called libsys r, uh, and I've got a, a, a macro package in Rust uh, that allows you to write uh, essentially code that looks identical to R code, but it's actually Rust code that allows you to write high performance uh, packages uh, in R using Rust. Um, and if you try to write high performance packages in R and you've tried to use something like RCPP to write in C++, that's pretty good, but some of the things, particularly around like numerical optimization, things like that, that's actually terrible. And you have to use another package called, uh, I think, RCPP numeric. Um, and then you have to write code, which doesn't look anything like R code. Um, but with my macro package, you can write Rust code that looks like R code, but it's Rust, so it runs fast. Um, so just an example of how fast it runs, I have, there's an R package called BFDA, um, and it's used for doing uh, sample size planning for base factor analyses. Um, it's not super important exactly what it does, but um, how it works is it runs simulations, uh, and it's incredibly slow. So to run like a single set of simulations, um, to do one like, you know, sample size plan, how many participants do I need, how many samples do I need to collect to be able to do this analysis. It can take up to six minutes to run. Um, I rewrote it in some slightly better R and I got the time down to a minute. Uh, and, um, but a minute is still slow. So what I did instead is I rewrote it as a Python package, but all the, the, the computations are actually done in Rust. Uh, and so to use it, you just use it like you use a, a regular Python package. So I can just, uh, I, you can just pip install it, then import it, and then run it. So, and it's gonna spit out uh, a array of tuples. I'm just gonna turn it into a, uh, into a pandas data frame, right? Um, and this now runs the simulations in 1.5 seconds, right? So instead of a minute, 1.5 seconds, a massive speed up, right? And you can just call it as easily as you call a Python package. And not only that, it was super easy to write because you can write it in like a high level style code. Um, and you can actually, the added bonus is you can use the C libraries that are included in, in R um, to do some of the numerical, the, the probability distribution stuff, which is actually the approach that, that Julia uses as well. And so you don't have to rely on like the statistical distributions that ship with SciPy 
which kind of suck, particularly the non uh, the non central t distribution. Um, so uh, an easy massive speed up. Um, okay, so. I've talked a lot about Rust, so where does Rust fit in? I've talked about Rust because I love Rust, but I also think it's useful for you as a data scientist. But the primary place where it's useful, I think, is in writing high-performance library code. So if you're writing libraries that are going to be used throughout your team, writing internal tools um, uh, or throughout your organization, I think Rust is a good uh, language to write it in, right? Particularly if you work, I know Jeremy's not here, but he works in like a a polyglot organization where he has some Python programmers and some R programmers. You can write libraries in Rust and then call it from Python or R, write once, run anywhere. Um, if you like writing functional style code, which I like writing, Rust is great for that as well. I think it's better for, for, for handling data. If you want to write parallel code, again, Rust is going to be great. If you're parsing data, so if you're dealing with JSON or XML or stuff like that, um, Rust type system and its ecosystem, particularly this crate called NOM, are fantastic for doing parsing, right? It makes parsing a breeze and it's fast and you can deal with things like streaming data. Again, it's trivial, it's easy. Rust makes it possible. Um, so if you find any of these things appealing, I really recommend that you check out Rust. Uh, Ferris will thank you for it. Um, and there's a link to the slides if you're want to click on some of the links if you want to find out more about some of the things I, that I've talked about. And that's, that's it. <laughs>